Okay, well, uh, thank you, Beverly. I appreciate that. That was uh, that's uh, refreshing. And uh, people do sometimes when you begin to unveil the mysteries, people get upset with you. But it's not really their fault. They just no. don't know. They yeah. just, it's just like, well, you know, I, I uh, when I first started to getting into the kind of research that I do, I was, uh, I would get angry in my own studies at, at God or source or whatever, and kind of throw my Bible over and say, well, what in the world is the truth? You know, you can get frustrated. And I have so many people that I talk to that they, they don't read the Bible, they quit reading it. And I say, I don't blame you. I don't blame anybody because of the way that it has been manipulated and twisted. I said, however, it is filled with gold. It is filled with the golden nuggets of truth but you're not going to get them just by reading it. It just will not happen. You have to dig. You have to really dig and lay aside a lot of the styrofoam. And it's, it's got a lot in it. It's got a lot of styrofoam. And so uh, the, the story that's always been told is the story of who we are. And it doesn't matter what culture or where in the world you went. Everybody was telling that story. They told it with different characters, uh, using different names, but it was always a story. It was not a, a real, literal person that they were talking about other than, other than you, <laughs> other than, than me. I was the only literal person in the story. I always am. You are always the real, literal person that's in the story. But the story is always about us. It's about you and me, and about and it's about how to live your greatest life. Amen. That's what it's all about, and getting a hold of that truth. Everybody wants that truth and don't know how to get it, and try to find it in everything except the place that it's at. And so that's what I say constantly about the scripture: is digging into it to find that truth, because that truth is about you. So I wrote this little note. I said, the Bible, so-called, that we call it the Bible, we've been taught to call it that, is a compilation of letters and books that are written over periods of hundreds of years. It is not and it never was written to be a history of a special chosen people. Now, isn't that controversial? I, you know, everybody would get all mad at me because, oh, but Brother Glenn, you know the Jews are God's special people and God chose the Jews. I, said, I don't know that. And Scripture don't say that. Or the Bible don't say that. Now, you may, you may try to make it say that from interpretation or translation, but if you really look and see who are the chosen, you'll realize you are. And when I say you, I'm talking about anybody that's human. When you were made human, you became the chosen vessel of God. And God chose you to be its home. And that's what the choosing is all about. And that's who we are. We are the home, the house, the place of God's dwelling. But that's a difficult thing even though we say it. So it's not about a special people, chosen people, but it's a compilation of books and letters about the greatest mystery of all and that great mystery is God in you that is the mystery and so we are the the house of that mystery so what I would like for you to do if you will turn with me in your Bible we'll look at several places I think Mark Mark's gospel Matthew Mark just turn to Mark chapter 1 and uh, look at this with me <clears throat> Mark chapter 1, and I'm going to read, ver Matthew and Mark are per pretty parallel. Mark is an astrological motif. It's, a, it's purposefully written to pro progressionally to follow the wheel of astrology. In other words, it starts 
with Aries and it moves around the 12 signs throughout the 14 chapters. And so it's, it's actually broken down that way. And there was a pastor over in, uh, I can't remember, New Zealand or Scotland or some, one of those uh, countries over there, Celtic countries, um, he wrote a book, and I can't think of the title of that book right now, but it's a tremendous book. It's probably 15 or 20 years ago that he wrote that book. And of course, it got a, it got a little bit of attention, but it kind of got pushed by the wayside because of its content and its research, just exactly like this book. This book did become the New York Times bestseller because it was so controversial, it just rattled a lot of people's mind. Now, book two and three of this same subject didn't get that much attention, but are equally as good as this book, and they're, they're tremendous. That's the book that Beverly's referring to. This is the first book. It was written in 1999, Jesus Mysteries. So Mark and, uh, Mark and Matthew parallel each other pretty much. Some people will argue over which is the oldest of the two books. Some will say Matthew, some will say Mark. And there's not any way to tell because we don't have any old manuscripts. We don't have anything prior to the Council of Nicaea 325. And a lot of people would say that we do, but we don't. There is no validation to show that we have any writings prior because everything prior to 325 that they could find, whether it was Gnostic material from Gnostic Christianity, which was true Christianity, or literalist Christianity that was being formed at 325. The reason they didn't is because the Catholic Church organized themselves in such a way they went throughout the world getting any material they could and burning it. And they literally burn it, burnt books by the hundreds of thousands. Yes, Beryl? Well, they say C-E common error um, before that. C-E -E starts with Jesus' birth, common error. That's from, up, from then up until now. Oh, so C-E -E would be from Jesus' birth up until now. And that's how we count the calendar. That We're on the Julian calendar, which actually wasn't even given to us until 17, uh, 1726, somewhere in the early 1700s, they gave us the Julian from the Gregorian calendar. Which, you know, and you, can, you could probably actually Google that and find that. They probably would still give you that. We think that the, we're counting the way we've always known, we've just been counting this way a couple hundred years, 17, 1700, 300 years or so, we've been counting like this with the dates that we've got. But we back those dates up to the common era. And that was a lot of the workings. And some of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist church protest that. And you can find a lot of good information from the Seventh-day Adventist church on that and on what the Catholic church has done. You can find a lot of true history through the Seventh-day Adventist Church on Constantine. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's there, it's available, so whosoever will, if they go digging. Come on in. Uh, is, is that a book back there for her? Behind? Yeah, there's one right back there. You can get that one. So, you know, it's like we were discussing earlier. It's hard to go back and do deep research in history because it's constantly being rewrote. And I remember something I read a long, long time ago. It says the winners write history the way they want history to be written. And so that's a sad truth. It is. So it doesn't matter if we in America are winning and writing the history the way we want it to be told. It's not necessarily true. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's sad. So, you know, to go back and to read Josephus and think that you're going to get the true history of the Jews, you're not. You know why? That book has been, the writings of Josephus have been manipulated and twisted and a lot added to it. So, so anyway, there you go. Same thing's true with what I'm about to re read. <laughs> it's, been, it's been manipulated and twisted. So Mark chapter 1. But I want, you, you, I, I want to sh point out certain things and then maybe we can get on the same page 
And again, it's so hard to do that when we have been taught to believe all of these things and then something is said and you hear it and it pricks your ear and say, oh, that's not what I believe. That's different from the way I've been taught. If we would just approach it with that, with that idea, it's different from the way I've been taught. The way you've been taught don't, mess, don't necessarily make it true or right or the truth. And dealing with that might be difficult. I had to remember I come to a place in my life that I realized that my grandpa wasn't God and what everything grandpa said wasn't true. <laughs> and so that was a realization, an awakening for me. And that didn't happen when I was really younger. It happened later on in life. I think after grandpa had even died because, you know, I thought grandpa was God's big brother. So, <laughs> so anyway, open mind is a difficult thing. It's difficult to really open your mind mm -hmm. and to say, well, okay, I'm going to be open and hear this without the prejudices of my beliefs. That's the difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. So, it, and re I'm going to read this. I'm going to point out things to you. And you can, if you want to make, do some research on it, you can do it if you want to. Uh, you don't, I've done it for you, a lot of it, but if you want to validate it, that's perfectly fine. Do it for yourself. Mark chapter 1, verse 9, it came to pass in those days that Jesus came to Nazareth. Now, if you go back in history and you study, you've got to start off right out of the get-go and realize this is a story, it's not history. So how can you get that? Because there wasn't a city named Nazareth. There wasn't. And you see that now see what would happen right there? Oh, what do you what do you mean? No, there is not even a place. Matter of fact, the word Nazareth is not even found in the Old Testament. Period. You won't find that word in the Old Testament. Now the word Nazarite is an Old Testament word, but it's not a city and it's not a place. It's any individual who's consecrated himself. Any person who consecrates himself for any kind of service. In other words, whether it's through ceremonial washing, in other words, baptism, or through eating, fasting, any person, it doesn't matter, color, race, it doesn't matter. Any person who consecrated themselves for, for uh, spiritual purposes or to raise himself up higher or to, to try to grasp who he or she really is was a Nazarite. It's not a town. It's not a place. So right here, right out of the starting gate, right off this first word right here, Nazareth, Nazareth, it's not a town. You've been taught to think it was a town. It is really an astrological motif. And the word Nazareth or Nazareth just simply means a place of inferiority and it's a symbol of the physical tabernacle or the house because it's inferior to the spirit. So the first thing you get out of this picture is that if you can understand the picture of this story is this story is that place of inferiority where Jesus and actually <coughs> let me see if, let me put this on the board and see it and I, I realize right now I can hear the wheels kind of turning so now you're thinking which is a good thing but if you'll just think and keep an open mind while you're thinking that's better now that's the circle with the cross in it is ancient it, you know you can find it all over Egypt carved in stone in the pyramids different places in temples and places. So it's an ancient symbol. So it's been around. And it all it has so much depth in it. Just that, just that has so much depth in it. Like for instance, I'll show you this part of it uh, I'm gonna talk about here in just a minute. These two parts, this is Capricorn. This is December. The 21st, that's when, that's when winter, that's Capricorn, <coughs> that's a despised place, that's a symbol of the physical, that's a symbol of the natural, it's a symbol of that place where every one of us come, where we've been, where we come from the, that womb, which was a tomb, the natural, 
and we come into this place. Now, see, a lot of people would say, well, then the physical is just inferior. You just want to get rid of it. No, the physical is the, it, it's the mystery. you got to come back to remember your body is the mystery. You're not just wanting to get rid of it. You're wanting to redeem it and raise it up to its potential. So we can live and die and never, ever even tap a portion of our potential. And most of us do. And if you just play religion, it's all you ever do is play religion. Religion can feel good, and then it can feel bad. <laughs> so it's just that yang, 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 and there you go, yo. It's just up and down and up and down and up and down. It never, ever will bring you to the place that God designed you to be. The physical... It, I mean, you know, so, so many cults and so many religious ideologies wants to destroy the physical. But we're going to keep coming back to it and keep coming back to it and keep coming back to it because it's perpetual. And in that, in that that it perpetuates, we come back, hopefully, to raise ourselves up another rung on the ladder of who we really are. Who are we? We are God, man, made flesh. God, woman, made flesh. That's who we are. And so, do we have the potential of greatness? Everyone. Yes, absolutely. So this being the despised place is the place of winter. It's the place of, of cold, of death. What, and death, again, you've got to remember, death is not a place of cessation of being. Death is a place to begin to be what you've been designed to be. Always remember this. A seed must fall into the ground and die. If it was, if it stops of being, if it just rotted, if it just had nothing, then it, it, it would be nothing. But no, when you put the seed in the ground and it dies, that's when it starts to become what the seed is designed to be. Otherwise, it'd just be a seed on the shelf. I remember I have a jacket in my grandfather's and it's got some corn seed in the pocket that I'd say that corn seed in that pocket right now is probably close to 100 years old. Mm -hmm. Because I've had this jacket from my grandfather. It may not be that much old, but I will guarantee you I can take one of those kernels and put it in the environment of its place of being and that seed will begin to be what that seed is designed to be. Our problem is we haven't begun to be what we're designed to be. That's why we should gather. That's the only reason we should gather. We're not getting together to see how, how much, who sinned more than anybody else or who's got greater problems than others. We haven't done. Well, that's not what we come together for. We've come together to grow, to be nourished, to be fed, to, to, to be stretched. That's the only reason we should ever come. This should, should be nothing less than a place of learning. That's all it should be. It should be a school. And that's what... But what have they made church into? They haven't made it into a place of learning. Uh, or, yeah, you do learn a lot of things. So, it came to pass, Jesus came to Nazareth. And that word Nazareth, you can just look it up. It just simply means a place of inferiority. It's a type of you being born in the physical, uh, in the natural. It I, Actually, the word also, the word Nazareth, just simply means an offshoot. And that's exactly who you are. You're an offshoot from your mother and your father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he came to this place of Nazareth, of Galilee. You see the word Galilee? The word Galilee actually means the, the astrological wheel. The word Galilee means wheel or zodiac. Just look it up. Mm -hmm. Just look. So here this inferior one, or you, this off she comes from the astrological wheel. Well, that's the truth of every one of us. You see, as above, in other words, the stars, the sun, the moon, the energy, the source, so below, the physical, the natural. That's what created you, that's what builds you, is the energy of those, those astrological, you can call it God if you'd like, I mean, that's exactly what it is. A, a starology. A star. What is a star? It's a light in the sky. Well, what is God? God is light. A starology is the study of light. So astrology is the study of light. That's what it's all about. It's not, I mean, it's not of the devil. <laughs> you know? So many people think, oh my God, y'all talk about astrology down there? 
I mean, yeah, we'll read your sign. <laughs> <laughs> Talk, we'll tell you all about your son. So, it's uh, I want to read you something of this book that Beverly was talking about. I don't even know if she's got to this place. Maybe she has. Uh, and uh, maybe this will resonate with you because I want you to hear this. But let, let me, well, just before I read it, let me read the, some more right here. It said, Came to pass in those days that Jesus of Nazareth, or you could put your name right there. You could put your own name right there. And you came from that lowly place. And it was that Gal Galilee, it was that astrological wheel that created you in the womb of your mother. Every day with that rotation of that wheel, every day as that wheel began to move, the energy from it continued to grow you in the womb of your mom. That's what grew it. Okay? And, said, and it was baptized of John in Jordan. Jordan is, comes from two words, Jor and Dan. It means a place of humility or a place of spread out judgment, not in the fact that you're being judged for what you're doing, but in the fact that you're being proven to be who you are. That's what, it's, that's what judgment is about. It's a place where you are being tested or proven that you are what God created you to be. And we live in that every day. It, it, the day will declare who you are, where it's designed to be that. Have you ever felt the pressure of the day? <laughs> the pressure of the day is meant to stretch you, to grow you. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to put you under or hurt you or, or pull you down. So he's being baptized. Now you hear this? And, and the word baptized, just use the word initiate. In other words, now he's being initiated. We talked about that, what, last week or the week before that? I can't remember. Remember mm -hmm. the different definitions you got? He's starting into something. He's a beginning. It's something to begin. And that's what initiation is all about. In other words, if you're, let's say that you're 20 year old and you're initiated into a truth, well, you're starting a new, a new part of your life, a new journey. Uh, you're beginning again, or being, beginning something new. So let me read you something this book says about this. Jesus' mission begins with his baptism of, by John the Baptist. Mythologists such as Joseph Campbell have seen ancient mythological motifs behind this story. And then he quotes from, y'all have heard of Joseph Campbell, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Joseph Campbell was a, he was a mythologist. He's been dead for a long, long time, probably 50 years, but he had, wrote a lot of books, a lot of good books. Here's something that he wrote. He says, the rite of baptism was an ancient rite coming down from the old Sumerian temple city, Uridu of the water god Ea, god of the house of water. You have to tune your ears. Anytime you talk about water, we're talking about you because you're a, you're a water vessel. You're 75 to 90% water more. And so anytime you see the motif or the, or the use of the word water, or let me say this also, the use of the word daughter, or the use of the word mother, it's always referring to water. And it's not just it's not just in a story talking about a woman. It's talking about any vessel that's water, that's you and me. Mm -hmm. So, the God of the house of water. In the Hellenistic period, Ea was called O Anas. O-A-N-N-E-S. O Anas. Which is in Greek, I O Anas which is in Latin, John, J-O, or what, you know, Johannes, which is in Hebrew, Johanna, or Jonah, or Joseph. It's all the same thing. Which is in English, John. So what is he saying? He said, now here is a story about Jesus and John, which is an astrological story. That's what I was telling you. That uh, when you start to see it and you start to understand it, then it makes a lot of sense. It, you know, it just kind of dings. Oh, okay. Several scholars have suggested, therefore, that there was never either John or Jesus, but only a water god and a sun god. This right here, December the 21st, is about the water god. And June the 21st
is about the Son God. And if you look at the astrological wheel, and it it's, it's never fails, it's perfect, it's set in stone. June the 21st is the beginning of summer. Sun. Mm -hmm. December the 21st is the beginning of winter. winter. Cold. Water. That's when you start having all your water. June the 21st, January, February, snow, rain, etc., etc., ice and stuff. June the 21st is your sun god. This is John's baptism of Jesus. And here you have the motif. It's an astrological motif of both of these guys, and that's exactly what they're trying to say. If you have an eye to see it or an ear to hear it. He goes on and he says this, Examining the stories of John the Baptist and Jesus, we do seem to be clearly in mythological territory. Their two stories reflect each other perfectly. They both have miraculous births. John is born to an old woman. Jesus is born to a young woman. John's mother is infertile. Jesus' mother is unfertilized. John is born at the summer solstice when the sun begins to wane. Jesus is born six months later at the winter solstice when the sun begins to wax again. On December the 21st, and then you got one, two, three days and a half, three and a half days. On December the 21st, the sun on the northern hemisphere disappears and it looks as if though it, 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 it's dead. In other words, you do not see the sun in the sky at all in a 24 hour period. It's just not there. Now it's still partially light, just like if you go to Alaska and you still see the sun uh, but up in the northern hemisphere of uh, Rus Russia and China, that whole area, you will not see the sun for three days. And then after the third day, 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, then after the 24th on the 25th, you start to see the sun again. Now that's every year, and it doesn't matter what, how you want to twist or wobble or do anything, that's how it happens, and it happens that way every year. And so you can see how the sun dies, in other words, it's no longer there, you can't see it, S-U-N. And then three days later, three and a half days later, the sun is raised again, is resurrected. Now if you listening clearly, you can see the story of Jesus, how that he dies, and three days later he rose again. Why? It's the story of the sun and its journey. And it's also the story of you and your journey. It's a story of how your life... So you can see here, it's, it, it's all based in astrology. Jesus must say, he must grow, let's see, John is born six months later. The winter soldiers, when the sun begins to wax again, hence the, Bab the Baptist declaration about Jesus, he must grow greater and I must become lesser. You, can you hear the waxing and the waning there of the, of the S-U-N? Isn't that true? That's what happens. Mm -hmm. John is born in the astrological sign of cancer. That's, that's what I've got here. This is cancer. June the 21st, that's the first day of the sign of cancer. Uh, <clears throat> John's baptized with water. Jesus was baptized with fire. Is that right? Then what Jesus said, I'll baptize you with fire, right? Mm -hmm. And John said, I'll baptize you with water. So, so are you baptized with fire and water? <laughs> yes, you are. The birthday of Jesus is celebrated on the pagan festival of returning to the sun on December the 25th. The birthday of John the Baptist is celebrated in June, replacing the pagan midsummer festival of water. Baptis baptism was a central rite in the mysteries as long ago as the Homeric hymns. We hear the ritual purity was the condition of salvation and the people were baptized to wash away all of their previous sins. Gosh, can you hear that? And this is this was a this was rituals they did thousands of years ago, way way prior to any of the stories that we histor we've historized. And and he just goes on and on. I just wanted to 
point that out right there, a little bit of that about those notes. So I want to read you some of my notes that I, I started to read last week and I didn't get to because I wanted to uh, show you something in the book of Daniel. Kirby was talking about the book of Daniel. If you would, just find the book of Daniel, turn over there to Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9, I'll, I'll read it here in just a minute. But I want to read you, uh, I wrote this about a month ago, a little over a month ago. It says, in the Sanskrit, the Ida, which is moon child, or right brain, or the feminine, and Pingala, which is the sun child, or the left brain, or the masculine. When we balance these two channels, we, and we all have that, masculine and feminine. We've talked about that many times, Esha and Esha. When we balance these channels, the masculine and the feminine energy, the results of balancing them is raising up something else in the center of our being, which is called the Christos. It's oil. We've talked about that too. Because you have, you have in your physical body, your physical body is a chemistry factory. Right? Your physical body, I'm saying, say, I'm saying, I want you to get it. Your physical body is a chemistry factory producing chemicals, oils. If you get real excited, you'll produce an oil called adrenaline. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so your body can do that, and it can do it, I'm talking uh, quicker than you can bat your eye. It can do it instantly. I mean, you can, if something happened, all of a sudden, if, if a loud noise went on out there just, and you're not expecting all of a sudden a loud noise, I mean, instantly your hair will stand up. Mm -hmm. Especially if it scared the hell out of you or scared heaven into you. <laughs> you know, instantly. I mean, your response is that quick. That's how phenomenal your physical body is. It just works that way. You can get in a real tight place and instantly your intuition will take over. It, it just will do that. It'll just automatically, responses will start to take place instantly. Like if something's coming at you, you'll instantly mm -hmm. flinch or dodge or whatever. Because that's how, that's how your body's made. So when, you be, when we, I, you, us, <laughs> We start to balance this right and left hemisphere of our brain. We begin to raise up this oil, this energy. We call this energy the Christos, which is a, it flows up the Sushima, which is a Sanskrit word that simply means the core of my being. I would say the backbone, the, the nerve system, because it, that's the track that it runs on. It, run, it runs on the track of your nerve system, which goes to every point of your body, right, from your bottom of your feet to the hairs on your head. The person or persons who become aware of this presence of this energy, you hear what it become aware of this. What is it, what is becoming aware, becoming conscious? We have a terminology that's used in in a lot of cults and a lot of uh, new age material that's called awake. That you're awake. You are awake. But just because you're awake don't mean you're aware. Don't mean you're paying attention. When we learn to be aware and pay attention, then we can begin to direct a lot of the things that's happening in our life. But if we ignore it, or if we're distracted, it's so easy to get distracted. I guarantee you right now I could be saying something and it could, you could be saying, wow, okay, I'm getting that. And if you have your phone on vibrate, or no, and all of a sudden, boom, that phone, <coughs> uh, you feel it in your pocket, or you feel it vibrate in your purse, or all, you got distracted instantly. And now your phone becomes the most important thing you've got. And it ain't, it's probably just garbage that's coming off the news. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you know what? Because of that, you'll miss the probably one of the most important things that you were meant to get. Mm -hmm. Because of dis distractions, because distractions takes you away from awareness. Were you awake? Yes, you were awake. And even in your wakefulness, you still were distracted. 
So we're not talking about waking you up. That's what new age stuff. Well, it's time for us to all wake up. No, it's time for us to pay attention and become aware. That's exactly what the nachesh is all about. That's what the serpent is all about. Us be paying attention and becoming aware so that I begin to direct the things that's happening in my life. I'm, I'm in charge of those things. And in, in my being in charge, if I ignore certain things, then hey, guess what? Anything can come in. And it does. It gets in. So, uh, merging the masculine and the feminine energy within us has has will bring us to a place and I'm using a term and you hear this term a lot of times you're going to hear this term some in biblical term terminology you come to a place of the end or in other words the end of time or in other words you come to a place where time it's not that you're stopping time and time doesn't exist there'll never be a point in place where that happens because if you stop time then you stop life if you stop the movement of the universe, do you understand everything in the universe is spinning and swirling and moving? Mm -hmm. The only one thing that's not spinning and swirling and moving, and, and all that spinning and swirling and move, moving is called action, movement. But there is something that's ten, a hundred times greater than all of that spinning and moving and action. Do you have an idea what that is? It's called stillness. It's all of that that seems to be nothing that's between all of that that seems to be something. And if you look out in the sky right now and all you can see is the sun and the rest is just blue, which is the greater? The blue. It's a hundred times more of that. If you look at the sun, I mean, look at the sky at night, and you see all of the black. All of the black contains all of the little dots. You hear what I'm saying? Just like if you look into an atom, and all you see are these three little things just bouncing around like going crazy inside that one little atom. Which is the greater? The empty space, the stillness that's inside of all that jumping around, moving around. All that jumping around and moving around inside you, there's something much greater than that, and that's called stillness. Mm. Well, who in the world wants to go there? Well, everybody. Because <laughs> it's there's where the answer's at. Right. It's in the stillness. Mm -hmm. That's where the still, quiet voice is God's at. Right. Oh, well, I can't do that. I'm too busy. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's when you come to the end of time. That's when you begin. It's not that you come to the end of time. It's not that time. As a matter of fact, let's see. Paul said something. Did I tell you I'll turn to Daniel? Yeah. Well, hold your place in Daniel and go to Ephesians real quick. Let me. I'll show you. I'll show you something here. Then you can put this in your pipe and smoke if you like, or uh, chew on it, or get mad about it, or do whatever you'd like to do. But go to Ephesians chapter 3, I believe it's where. Can we just follow the whole then? Uh, can we just swallow that whole? Yeah, swallow the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, do you good. Ephesians chapter 3. Yeah, here we go. Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 21. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21 says, Unto him be glory in the churches by Christ Jesus throughout ages, throughout all ages, world. What does it say? Huh? Nobody found it? <laughs> verse 21 Ephesians chapter 3 verse 21 I'll just wait on everybody to find it what does it say somebody read it out of your translation unto him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus throughout all ages world without end Amen. world without end Oh, you mean it's not time's not going to stop? Now, what are you going to do with that passage of scripture when you turn over to the book of Revelations in the twenty-first chapter? And it says time will be no more. Mm -hmm. One of them's wrong. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> One of them's wrong. Yeah. Or maybe both of them's right. Mm -hmm. If you can understand what they're saying, mm -hmm. that's the conundrum. 
Because so many people get, I was talking to somebody just this past week, you know what one of the things that they said? Oh, the world is just about to come to Amen. What? Amen. What? Oh, really? It's, it, why? You mean because of the mess that they got going on in Washington? Hey, what's come around has been. It come, it come around again. Y'all may have forgot how it was back in the 80s. When gas got up, what was it? When gas got up to, uh, what, $4 or something a gallon? Do y'all remember that? I remember that I was going to a conference, and you know the, the biggest thing that concerned me? I told Connie, I said, the problem is going to be getting gas and having enough money to get the gas to get there and come back. Mm -hmm. Because gas was $4.56 a gallon. That ain't been long ago, folks. Hadn't been long ago either. And yet, look at what's happening to us now. And what they're saying, I think I got one news flight said, uh-oh, they ain't got no more food on the shelves in one place that just shut down for the next 90 days. Not going to produce, not sending out any more canned goods. And you know what everybody in America starts doing? Oh God! Oh, the end of the world! We're going to starve to death! And all of that crap is to get you and me in fear to get us to get us off the track to, so that we're not aware. We're not, we're not paying attention. We are awake. I guarantee you we're awake, but boy, we're not paying. World without end. It, it ain't going to come to an end. You don't have to worry about it. The globe, the earth's not going to quit spinning, folks. It's just going to keep spinning. I tell you, as long as it keeps spinning, there's going to be life on it. Now, we might, uh, we might be stupid enough to drop some kind of a bomb and destroy the majority of the life that's here, but it'll come right back. Life will come back. Why? Because that's how it's designed. That's how it's created. That's how the source created it. So, this whole idea, people say it, and right now, that's probably one of the most herald messages the preachers are preaching right now. We're just about to end the time. In other words, Jesus is just about ready to come back and get y'all. You, you know, y'all just really get happy and get ready. Do like Steve used to do with his kids. Go ahead and lay your clothes out and get ready to fix him and go home. <laughs> I, I mean, come on, how foolish could we possibly be in the 21st century? Come on. I mean, wake up, good gracious. Thing. And I hear it all the time from different people, you know, out in public just talking and saying, oh, it, you, you know, Brother Lynn, you're a preacher. You know it more than anybody. The world is just about over. It's just about to come to an end. No, <laughs> not my world. Not my world. The end of time, not as, not as in stopping the sun from moving or the earth from rotating. That is not what the ancients meant when they talked about no time. When they talked about no time or talked about an end, they're referring to a place where you come to that time is not dictating to you anymore. Now, wouldn't that be something if you and me begin, could do that and begin to realize that it's a, it's a conundrum, and it's a huge question mark in the biological scientific community of the doctors. Why do we age? Why do we get old? Because our body is constantly rejuvenating, constantly rebuilding itself. And yet, what happens to us? We seem to get old. Our hair falls out. Some of it turns a little white here and there. Still got some black somewhere in it. No. No, okay. <laughs> Y'all lie for me. <laughs> It turned black, man. It turned loose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It did all, didn't it? It did. Yet I'm holding on 59. Hallelujah. <laughs> we have become controlled by the body-mind rather than the way that we were created, which is to control the body-mind. See, look. We have, been, we have become controlled by the body mind rather than being the way we were created to control the body mind which is to control the body mind these are making the two the esh and the esha the ada and pangala the sun and the moon making the two one so that they they work in harmony. 
Just like our sun and moon. They work in harmony. Mm -hmm. And create our own experience rather than our experience creating us. Can you see mm -hmm. how this is? And that's exactly how this, the, the usage of the word serpent has been, dis, has been so twisted so that we think the serpent represents Satan, the devil Lucifer, that now is in control of, the, what does they say, that two-thirds of the population of the earth are all under the control of Satan? Lucifer, the devil? It's only certain special chosen ones or Christians that's, that's not, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you give more credit, give more, well, give more power to this energy mm -hmm. that's in the hand of the source than we do I mean, it's, it's backwards. So, rather than to make the two one and create our own experience rather than our experience happening and controlling us, it's not that which the mind can think, but that whereby the mind can think. You, you can control what the mind's thinking. Just because a thought comes to you, you do not have to entertain it. I remember Brother Hagen said something. You cannot stop, and this I thought it was a good phrase, and I still quote it, I'll use it. You cannot stop Satan from flying over your head and dropping something on it. But you can stop yourself from thinking about what he did. And I'm kind of paraphrasing what Brother Hagen was saying. And I you're not going to stop the thoughts from flowing. They just come. You know, you say, where did that come from? Yeah. Or maybe that don't happen to y'all. It happens to me. I had a thought yesterday that come out of the blue, and I thought, where in the world did that thought come from? God, look at that. That guy was doing that? Really? I mean, really? And I, a piece of paper ignited this thought in me, and you know I got to look at that paper, and I thought, my God, I, that's proof right there that that, that that guy was doing that. And do you know what? I mean, I was in a tizzy over this thing. I mean, it had me in a mess for phew, half the day. And so I thought, well, I know how I'll fix this, bless God. I'm just going to write a letter, and I'm going to straighten that out right now. And I, got, and I actually did. I got down to write the letter. And I thought, let me look at that piece of paper again. And I'll be doggone. I looked at that piece of paper. And do you know who that was on that piece of paper that I thought was this other guy? You knew. It was me. <laughs> <laughs> it was myself. And I, I thought, oh, God. I, actually, I broke in tears. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> look, how, look how that has, has just so twisted half of my day. Thinking it was somebody, and it was. It was me, myself, and I. All three of me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, it was all three of me doing it to myself. And oh, Lord, have mercy, I thought. Isn't that how we do? Isn't that what happened to us? <laughs> wow. It's not that which the mind can think. It's that, but that which by, which by there by the mind can think. I can direct it. Thinking is but a tool. But we have elevated it from a tool to a place of control. Thoughts arise from the same vibrations of source or the outer senses. And so I am given those senses from the source to serve me, not to control me. And, and you know, most of the time what happens to all of us is, or I'm, I'm saying all of us, I'm saying to me for sure, just like that little that little story, that little analogy. I mean, you just wouldn't know how I was in the tizzy. I got so twisted about it. I asked Rochelle, I said, what do you think about this, Rochelle? She said, well, Daddy, I think you're right. Go ahead and write the letter. <laughs> <laughs> I had her convinced, and I thought, oh, shh. Then I got looking, and I went back, and I thought, good graciousness, I am the source. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, did y'all find the book of Daniel? My goodness, I'm... Rambling around here, around here get a lot of other. <laughs> Daniel, the book of Daniel, and I'll show you something here in the book of Daniel. I'm not going to have a lot of time here to kind of really delve into this a whole lot, but I want to show you uh, 
Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Daniel 9, verse 25. So know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, seven weeks and three score and two weeks. And the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince shall be destroyed, the city and the sanctuary, and the end. Everybody say end. 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 Everybody say Kates. 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 You can say K A T E S. Kates. Can y'all say that? Kates. That's Kates. the Hebrew word for end. Now, when you see the English word end, what do you think? Motel. Six. End. You think end? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Yeah. It's all over. Yeah. End. There. Okay. And, and the end thereof with the flood unto the cates. If I say cates, the end okay. of the end of the war and the desolations are determined. Now, cates, the Hebrew word cates, it's actually just made up of two glyphs. It's the kof and the final ayin. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the final non, noun, non, Kate's. All right, then I want you to look back at verse 24. And, and this is just the very tip of this iceberg of, the, of this word. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm not going to even have time to try to, I'm not going to take the time to even try to delve into it, but I wanted you to just see and listen. Verse 24 says, Seventy weeks are determined upon my, upon my people, and upon seventy weeks... Uh, look at this, 70, and a week is how long? Seven, seven, seven days. days. 70 weeks. Seven sevens is what? 490. 490. Now that's a very important number in numerology, okay? And it's used a lot. And so some people get into this counting mode of days or years, counting 490 years, 490 days. Some of them get in different kind of counting modes and count that literally. Literally. And I always get in trouble because always what it winds up doing is projecting or prophesying or predicting something. Always it winds up being that way. And that's what they do when they read this. Why? Because they're, they're reading this with a literal eye, not a mythological eye. And there is a huge difference. When you start to learn to read this with a mythological eye and realize this is not literal. This is not about literal times, not about literal people. This is a mystery. This is mysterious. So everything in here is filled with allegory, typology, and fabulous story. Now I've got to find out. Cinderella and her slipper is a story. It literally didn't happen. <laughs> oh come on now <laughs> it did not happen I mean the three pigs and the huffing and the puffing and all the blowing of the houses down didn't really happen y'all it's a story <laughs> these are fabulous stories now listen watch this right here 70 weeks are determined upon my people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make a what to make it a what and of sins. Can, can you say this? Say, katha. 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 That's the word for end. Oh, you mean the word for end there in verse 24, and the word for end in verse 26 is a different word? Mm -hmm. Completely mm -hmm. different. Katha. Mm -hmm. Kates. I mean, they sound, they sound different. Mm -hmm. Totally spelt different. Totally have different geometric values. Completely different. Don't even have anything to do. So what is this end? Is this end talking about it's over? Kaput? As we would, as we would take the word end to mean? No. Not at all. Not at all. Not even close. Go with me one other passage of Scripture real quickly. Revelation chapter 1.
Everybody just say seven. 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 God, that's, a, that's the number, isn't it? Seven. Seven. That's the number. I mean, that is it right there. Seven. Everything is about it. It's seven. You go into Scripture, you're going to have to, you're going to have to uh, really get with the program and really pay attention to seven because seven is the number. It's uh, my, my red one. It don't even work. It's brand new. Mm, I hate that. I really wanted to do that in like a living color. Now what I'm doing is I'm making this pie the way one, one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven. I'm making that pie seven. Now, I'm telling you, seven from Genesis 1 through a whole rest of this book that we call the compilation of the Bible, seven is the key number. And you are the seven. You are the complete. And you are the perfect building that God built. Nothing's wrong with it. Now, things go awry with it. By the way, that's uh, uh, Margaret and her daughter. Margaret called and asked us to lift them up because her daughter was sick and, and, she, and she'd be fine. They'd be here next Sunday. So anyway, I forgot to tell you all that. So remember that. Seven is key. Even in the astrological wheel, seven is key. Because this, uh, this number, the ram, is, is uh, actually the picture of the head of a human being And uh, that's a head of a baby. And this, this number right here, Taurus, is referring to the neck right here, the neck and the shoulders. And then this, this number right here, Gemini, is referring to the two arms, the twins. And uh, this right here, number four, is referring to the cancer of the lungs. And this number right here, Leo, is referring to the heart that's in the cancer and the lungs. And this number right here, Virgo, is referring to the womb, the abdomen. And this number right here, seven, is referring to the pelvic, or you could, I would say this about the pelvic. The pelvic from, where, from which your legs come forth and balances you to where you can move. <laughs> Where you can get, you can up be, and this is your head from which you have uh, the ram or Aries, and the ram actually refers to the two separate sides of your brain, the left and the right. So you have the two separate sides of the left and the right that you need to balance. You come all the way down here to Libra, the pelvic, where you have a pelvic bone with two legs coming out, where you need to balance. Do you think that God wants you to balance everything from the from the top? To the bottom, out, absolutely. That's that's our work in life. When we learn to do that, we will have this energy that flows in us and flows through us. Then the end of time will be. In other words, you won't be moved. I won't get so distracted by a piece of paper that I misread and thought it was something else or someone else, and not realize it was me. <laughs> Everything is about that. Look at this. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. Write these things which thou hast seen. Everybody say seen. Seen. The things, write the things that you have seen. I will just write that on the board. Write the things which you have seen. S-E-E-N. Okay. Write the things which you have seen. Write the things which are. Everybody say are. 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 Write the things which are. And write the things which shall be what? Hereafter. Hereafter. H-E-R-T-A-F-T-E-R. So there's three things that I want you to pay attention to in this book. That's what he's saying. Write the things that you see, you've seen. 
Now watch what he says next. The mystery of the seven stars which you what? Saw. Which you saw. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean you've seen these. The mystery of the seven stars. Well, here's the mystery of the seven stars I've got them right mm -hmm. here on the board for you. Mm -hmm. The mystery of the seven stars is the abdomen of your physical body. Mm -hmm. It's that place that's the, that's the miracle temple, the house of God. It's the building of God. This book is about that. The book of Revelation is a book about the miracle of the body. And they call it by different terms. They call it a candlestick of seven lights. They call it church or ecclesia or a place where the energy of vocal of voice, that's what the church is. It's the place of the energy where you can speak and you, and you can pronounce your world. And it goes in. And then he says, uh, well, let's just read on. Thanks what you've seen. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which you have saw in my right hand, the seven gold, and the seven golden candlestick, the seven stars are. Now remember, won't you write the things which you see? The things which are. Here's what they are. They are the angles the word angel and the word angle are the same word. You see this astrological wheel? Each one of these zodiacal signs is an angle in that wheel. And it makes up 30 degrees each angle and each angle has separate energy from the next angle. And this is exactly what he's saying. He said, and the angles are the, which you, angels, same thing, lights uh, of the seven churches and the seven candlestick which you saw are the seven churches. Mm -hmm. It's all about the seven and this is the seven churches, the physical anatomy of the body. And then come over to chapter four. Remember he said I want you to write, uh, pay attention here. He says the things you see, the things which are and the things that are after. Right? Look at chapter 4. What's the first word? After. After, after the. Okay. Then the rest of the book begins to deal with the after. The rest of your life begins to deal with the after. After you begin to realize who you really are, then the after will take place. And the sad thing about the after is it will take place if you don't realize who you are. It'll just take place on its own. And it'll start to dictate what's happening. And you, rather than you and me doing it. And it's our job, it's my job to begin to dictate to me and to tell me this is how it's mm -hmm. going to be. This is how my world's going to unfold. Right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Alright, we'll just disconnect there and uh, pick mm -hmm. up there next week. We were talking